In the last couple years, I've noticed an increase in media satirizing the rich. Movies like Glass Onion and Triangle of Sadness and TV shows Succession and The White Lotus have garnered lots of attention, and for good reason. We live in a capitalist society, and a natural consequence of capitalism is inequality. Particularly in the recent years following the COVID pandemic, our economy has been struggling. Quarantine highlighted the severity of the wealth divide, as lower and middle class people fought to maintain jobs while the uber-wealthy jetted off to private islands and partied. In fact, this is partly the plot of Glass Onion. In the words of Philip Roth, satire is moral outrage transformed into comic art, and that is precisely what films like Glass Onion intend to be. Class commentary in films is not a novel theme, and an early example of this is My Man Godfrey, produced in 1936. In contrast to the often heavy-handed critiques of the rich in modern media, My Man Godfrey falls under the category of Horatian satire. It is lighter in tone and milder in its criticism, but nonetheless it has several messages. It's easy to consume, it is a classic screwball comedy after all, and you're only really conscious of the messages if you're looking for them. This is what makes it such effective propaganda. Before I get into the analysis, allow me to summarize my man Godfrey. Set in the 1930s, Irene Bullock is the youngest daughter of a wealthy family. She competes against her more refined, hostile sister Cornelia in a scavenger hunt to collect a plethora of impractical items, such as a bowl of Japanese goldfish, a baby goat, and a forgotten man. A term from the era of FDR, a forgotten man is a neglected man down on his luck, and in this movie, the primary forgotten man is Godfrey Smith. Godfrey lives in a Hooverville called the City Dump. Irene collects Godfrey and wins the scavenger hunt, then goes on to make Godfrey her butler slash protege. While Godfrey works for the Bullocks, Cornelia does her best to get Godfrey fired. From here, we continue to see aspects of a classic screwball comedy. Fast-paced, zany dialogue as Irene desperately tries to make Godfrey fall in love with her, overlapping quips and sarcastic remarks from an interesting assortment of characters, challenges to Godfrey's masculinity, the absence of sex but the presence of innuendo, and an eventual resolution of marriage. Additionally, the main overarching theme we see is capitalism and class conflict. The big reveal comes about halfway through the film, when it is revealed that Godfrey Smith is actually Godfrey Park, a once rich man from a wealthy family before he gave it all up for an old lover. Some time passes and Alexander Bullock, the father, announces that the women's frivolous spending has rendered the family broke. Godfrey saves them from falling into debt by gifting them with money he acquired by investing, thanks the family for all they have taught him, and resigns. I've repaid my debt, and I'm grateful to all of you. And so, good day. In the last five minutes of the movie, we are brought to the city dump again, which has now been transformed into a swanky nightclub called The Dump, run by Godfrey. Irene bursts into Godfrey's office and forces him to marry her, saying, Stand still, Godfrey. It'll all be over in a minute. (laughs) While My Man Godfrey is marketed as a rom-com, I would argue that it is a class commentary first and a screwball comedy second. From the moment we transition from a grimy dump to the glitzy Waldorf Ritz, class is immediately put at the forefront of the movie. Remember, My Man Godfrey was released in 1936, when America was still recovering from the Great Depression. Audiences wanted optimism, but they also wanted relatability and weren't super interested in seeing obscenely rich people flaunt their wealth on the big screen. It was also post-World War I, pre-World War II, meaning that America was still impacted by the first Red Scare. As historian Lawrence W. Levine puts it, Americans had long been taught that human beings were ultimately responsible for themselves, that material success was a sign of virtue and failure a sign of personal worthlessness, that poverty was not merely unfortunate, but somehow disreputable, even sinful, that unemployment was an indication of indolence and failure. America has always been an individualistic society, but in the early 1930s, the broader public became tired of President Hoover's ineffective laissez-faire approach to the Depression. Guilt and embarrassment at one's own failure to obtain a job was redirected into anger at the government for not doing enough. Pre-New Deal movies were bleak, I Am a Fugitive from 1932 captures the despair and dissatisfaction with the government that many people were feeling at the time. Marxism was slowly becoming more appealing, and the idea of determinism felt comforting in an out-of-control world. So enter FDR and the New Deal in 1933, 
tasked with restoring the economy and renewing confidence in capitalism. Movies did much to reflect and sway public attitudes as 60 to 75 million Americans went to the movie theaters every week. Even when you consider repeat customers, that's around 60% of the population. It was imperative that movies emphasized the, quote, right ideals, which went hand in hand with the production codes at the time. So we see a sudden surge in movies designed to inspire hope. Footlight Parade, 42nd Street, Pretty Lady. Even Walt Disney's Three Little Pigs was the most popular film in 1933, largely due to the way it portrayed hard work successfully paying off. At this point, Americans still prized individualism, but more specifically, they prized cooperative individualism. Cooperative individualism is not collectivism, and it's certainly not communism. Rather, it is a moral way of life that promotes competition while also recognizing that there is strength in supporting one another and in working collectively to achieve certain goals, to succeed both individually and as a community. Think less, every man for themselves, and more, every man works in a way that is mutually beneficial with every other man. In 1936, unemployment rates had gone down significantly. New Deal programs like the WPA and the Wagner Act were doing their jobs by getting people jobs, which was instrumental in improving the American spirit. So in this period of renewed hope and trust in capitalism, the theme that individuals could pull themselves up by their bootstraps and out of a crisis was popular, and getting back to the movie at hand, Godfrey Smith effectively does that. My Man Godfrey skillfully pleases every viewer, regardless of their socioeconomic status. How? At first glance, it would seem as if the movie would anger anyone that wasn't middle class. The upper crust Bullock family is painted as stupid and ignorant. The chaotic scavenger hunt scene profiles wealthy people as being empty-headed nitwits fit for insane asylums. Secondly, I was curious to see how a bunch of empty-headed nitwits conducted themselves. My curiosity is satisfied. I assure you, it'll be a pleasure for me to go back to a society of really important people. And as for the lower class, you could see how they would be offended as well. When we are first introduced to Godfrey, he is dehumanized. Among the various strange animal comparisons in this movie, <laughs> Godfrey is first treated like a horse. When Irene brings him into the hall to present him as an object, he is checked out like a racehorse. And later, he is somewhat equated to a stray dog. Oh, we don't know a thing about certain people. Someone should speak to Irene about her habit of picking up strays. What's a stray? You shut up. You must come between Irene and Godfrey. He's the first thing she's shown any affection for since her Pomeranian died last summer. <laughs> Essentially insinuating that men from the dumps are like dogs. But instead, my man Godfrey is able to appease everyone. Yes, rich people are portrayed as airheads, especially Angelica, I really couldn't stand her in this movie, but it's in a more lovable, goofy way. The movie makes the upper class seem so silly, riding horses into the library and so on, that it makes them seem more charming and eccentric as opposed to scheming and greedy. It also allowed real rich people to feel distant enough from the Bullocks that they wouldn't be so offended. And compared to other movies at the time that harshly ridiculed the rich, this light teasing was totally manageable. Additionally, the Bullocks are good people. The critical line comes when Alexander is pleading his family to stop spending money, and he says, I don't mind giving the government 60% of what I make, but I can't do it when my family spends 50%. Alexander makes it clear that the high taxes are not the problem. The problem is how wasteful his family is. In other words, money problems are a personal problem, not an inherent issue in a capitalist society. So this is where we see subtle propaganda, as many, most, conservative rich white people were hating on the New Deal at this time. My Man Godfrey proves that helping the poor and paying high taxes is actually a good thing, as everyone benefits in the end. For the lower class, the main message is that if Godfrey can do it, you can too. Godfrey could theoretically have left the dump and returned to his wealthy family at any point, but instead he decided to be a hard-working butler. By diligently plugging away at his job and making some vague investment using Cornelia's pearls, Godfrey becomes rich in his own right. Another important storyline was how moved Godfrey was by the men in the dump. Godfrey was inspired and humbled by the can-do attitude of the dump men, saying, But I met some fellows living there, on a city dump. Here were people who were fighting it out and not complaining. 
Perhaps the most famous line in this film is when Godfrey is conversing with Tommy Gray and says, One thing I discovered was that the only difference between a derelict and a man is a job. The point here is that all the forgotten men need is an opportunity, both in the movie and in real life. People without jobs aren't useless, they just need to be given a chance to reach their full potential. At its heart, it's a story of hope, and that if poor people trust capitalism, it will eventually work out and they will be able to pull themselves out of poverty. The big theme here is cooperation. The characters rely on one another, reflecting the we're all in this together attitude that motivated people in the depression. The Bullocks pay their taxes, Godfrey uses the Bullocks money to help the poor by creating the nightclub, rich people sustain the economy by going to the dump. The takeaway, the system works. Capitalism works. My Man Godfrey is capitalist realism. It was popular because it acknowledges the struggles of the working class while also offering a solution, employment and hard work, sweetened by romance and humor. And going back to what I said earlier about My Man Godfrey being effective propaganda, it works because it's not so in your face. In my experience, people in general are more likely to do or believe something if they think they have agency in doing so. John Pike, the director of a Washington defense think tank, said, Anyone who knows about propaganda knows the first rule of propaganda is that it should not look like propaganda. Americans were more willing to accept the idea that capitalism is good when it was showing up in more subtle ways, as opposed to the more overt, obvious propaganda style that German communists used, for example. With a total of six Academy Award nominations, My Man Godfrey was wildly successful. Its popularity launched it to become the first movie to be nominated for all four acting categories, though it did not win any. I would also like to point out that Alice Brady, playing Irene's mother, was the woman nominated for Best Actress, and personally, I found Cornelia's performance, played by Gail Patrick, to be much more compelling. But anyway, beyond class, My Man Godfrey somewhat appeals to feminists by putting the women in positions of power throughout the, most of the film. The patriarch of the Bullock family is consistently ignored and dominated by the women in his life. Additionally, Irene being the witty, high-class character while Godfrey's the poor man given a chance because of Irene's goodwill, turns the typical maiden-in-distress storyline on its head. However, it turns out that Godfrey is actually rich and smart as well, or was at one point, and the resolution has Godfrey getting back on his feet and maintaining a stable job, which would have comforted those who were concerned about shifting gender roles due to unemployment in the Depression. This is because it was easier for women to find jobs throughout the Depression, mainly because when most women worked jobs that were more crisis-proof, like waitressing, nursing, and other domestic services, whereas men's manufacturing jobs crashed along with the stock market. So while Irene is sort of the provider in the beginning, Godfrey ultimately emerges with some level of authority. Stereotypical gender roles have not been put back into place, but rather a new, more equal version of femininity and masculinity is able to be explored. This is how My Man Godfrey is able to simultaneously amuse both male and female viewers. To sum up My Man Godfrey in a single sentence, it is digestible content with a message. But then again, movies are sometimes made just for the sake of entertainment. We can read into the script and story as much as we'd like, but it's interesting to consider how the movie makers actually intended for this film to be understood. The screenplay for My Man Godfrey was written by Maury Reiskind, and he once said, A few years ago, I happened to receive an inquiry from an overly earnest, is there any other kind, young film scholar asking me to assist him with some insight into the allegorical implications of My Man Godfrey. The young man was constructing his thesis around the fact that the title character of Godfrey Park was supposed to be a representation of God. The key to understanding this assertion could be found in Godfrey's name, Godfrey. Wasn't it artistic of me to have devised such a meaningful idea? Well, as this all came as news to me, the most I could do for the young man was write back to him and inquire if he were certain that we were discussing the same movie. The desire to read some sort of symbolic message into the films of the 30s, when our only intent was to entertain, strikes me as a very strange endeavor. So with that being said, perhaps this entire video essay is pointless, and My Man Godfrey is nothing more than a fun screwball comedy. But at the same time, I do think that My Man Godfrey successfully portrays themes such as class politics, the masculinity crisis, responsible-slash-moral capitalism, and the Great Depression. Movies serve as portals through time, 
And by looking at various newspaper reviews from the time, it is clear that My Man Godfrey was a smash hit that lifted spirits. Oh, don't you? What difference does it make? Some people do just as they like with other people's lives, and it doesn't seem to make any difference. 